Hello everyone. So what we've got here is today's video on carbohydrates. Um, so let's get straight into it. So as always, we start with the study guide. I am going to actually be covering most of these points today. So I'm going to talk about general formulae and how we show um, monosaccharides. I'm going to talk about different classifications, so aldose and ketose. I'm going to show straight chain converting to ring structures. I'm going to talk about um, the condensation reactions, what carbs are used for, and um, how we form those polymers, and some of the chemical structures. These are important, particularly for the bio people, because I think bio people, you go into a bit more detail on, for example, like one, four glucose polymers, as opposed to some of the other types of glucose polymers. Um, you don't need to know the difference between the alpha and beta forms of the um, cellulose as well. Okay, so in terms of general structure, when we, sorry, let, let me just switch my pen. So let's just look at the word carbohydrate. When we break down that word, it's literally watered carbon. So I have a certain number of carbons and a certain number of waters. All carbohydrates have this formula. So I have a certain number of carbons linked to a di possibly a different number, possibly the same number of waters. Um, we then have um, the term saccharide. I can't remember whether there's two C's or not. So if it's a number, there's one. If it's a dye saccharide, there are two. So if I've got one sugar molecule on its own, one carbohydrate molecule, it's a monosaccharide. If I take two of those and condensation reaction them, I end up with a disaccharide. If I take a whole bunch and polymer them together, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, I end up with a polysaccharide. Okay, let's continue on. So we have different ways of classifying carbohydrates depending on a couple of their chemical properties. So if it is C5H2O5, it is called a pentose. So pent meaning five, pretty simple to remember. Then If I've got six carbons, the logic holds, it's called a hexose. Hex meaning six. The position of the oxygen, that's for the straight line. Let me switch pen color so you can actually read that. So that um, position of the oxygen is the, what's called the straight line form. Now, if it is an aldose, Aldose comes from aldehyde, and it is the C double bond O single bond H at the end of the molecule. If it is a ketose, it's a ketone. So it's where you've got the carbon oxygen in the middle, and then the sugar continues on on either side. We then have when these convert from the straight line to the ring form, 
whether there are five carbons in the ring or six carbons in the ring. And if they're five, they're furanoses. And if they're six, they are pyranoses. Now, in terms of what you need to know for the exam, you need to know aldose versus ketose. Um, bio people, a pentose sugar is something like ribose, which is what we see in DNA and RNA. And then furanoses and pyranoses um, also come up with some in some more advanced biology. I don't know if you cover that in HL or not. But for our purposes today, we mostly care about the distinction between aldoses and ketoses but you should be able to work that out based on your memory of organic chem. So as I said, aldoses and ketoses are the most important parts for um, the IB chemistry. These are straight out of your data book. So this is in the data book. You are given the straight chain forms of these two guys. So you're given that this has that double bonded oxygen at the end and this has my double bonded oxygen in the middle of my chain. That makes this an aldose and it makes this a ketose. So these straight chain forms are important but it's mostly once they convert into their ring forms that we tend to see them forming polymers and disaccharides and such like. So let me just fix my D slightly. That didn't help. Um, and let's continue on to how we make those ring forms. Pay attention to those double bonded oxygen. Again, all of these pictures up here, so our ring forms and our straight forms, these guys are straight out of the data book. I grabbed these two images down the bottom from um, the internet somewhere. I could probably track down references if you wanted. It's just showing that it is the position of that double bonded oxygen that makes a difference in terms of the structures we end up with. So these ways of representing the ring forms are called Hayward projections. Now we don't care about alpha versus beta glucose. Um, that's not part of the chemistry course. In Hayworth projections, we emit the carbons and hydrogens that are in the ring, but we show the hydrogens that are attached to the ring. Now, because um, this is a ring structure, my hydrogen and hydroxyl group here, they can't switch around. So if this ring forms and my hydrogen and oxygen are mirrored, that is an isomer. It isn't something that can just wiggle about in solution and do that. So that's why, and it is the fact that some of these things are below or above the line of this ring that make this structure important. Now, let's go back and think about some definitions from our organic chemistry. We have this oxygen that is bonded to carbons on either side. That makes those ethers. So these guys are ethers. So those are ether linkages. And they are formed by, let's look at these guys down the bottom, the interaction between a hydroxyl group and that carbon double bond oxygen. It's the same regardless of whether it's fructose or glucose. 
So you just need to know that these things can go from straight chains to rings. You don't need to know the electron transfer mechanisms. Okay, continuing on. So what we've got here is the condensation reaction between glucose and fructose to make sucrose. So what we see is, and it doesn't matter which oxygen gets grabbed for our purposes. Let me just get my highlighter and blue. So I've got the hydroxyl group from one sugar reacting with the hydrogen on one of the hydroxyl groups of the next one. This is a condensation reaction, so of course it makes water. But then what I end up with in terms of my organic product is a disaccharide. And another little bit in terms of naming, let me just switch pen colors quickly. This group here. So just like when we were joining together amino acids to make a polypeptide, this has the chemical group that we call an ether link or either an ether linkage, K-A-G-E, or an ether bond. I, uh, chemistry doesn't care which one you call it, bio might, I don't know. So that is an ether linkage, but because it's between two sugars, we can also call it a glycosidic. GL, it would be good if I could spell glycosidic bond. So ether is the general chemical name. Glycosidic is the name for an ether linkage between two sugars. Okay. So just just a quick side note, SACCHA, S-A-C-C-H-A, that means sugar. Glyco tends to also mean sugar as well. So when we look at one of some of the polymers, you'll see glyco come up once or twice. SACCHA means sweet. So one of the early um, artificial sweeteners that was made was called saccharin. It's also a term in English for somebody who is a bit soppy. So these are condensation reactions. They can happen between glucose and fructose. They can equally happen between two glucose monomers with exactly the same output in terms of water, just a slightly different disaccharide is formed. Okay, let's continue on. So this is a diagram that I've seen in a couple of different bio books over the years. Chemistry people tend to know better. There is a pretty decent sized mistake in this picture. Think about how we show skeletal structures and see if you can identify it. I'll give you a second. Okay, so the mistake that we've got here, let me switch to my red pen because I'm feeling teachery at the moment. When we're drawing skeletal structures, anytime we have a corner, it implies a carbon. So what this structure is effectively doing to this disaccharide, and it's exactly the same disaccharide we saw earlier, what this is implying is that there are these two extra carbons next to that um, glycosidic linkage. So make sure that when you are drawing these, you are drawing nice straight lines between car these carbons and the oxygens. There isn't this right angle here. Okay. So there are a couple of different um, starch polymers, each of which have their own sort of purpose. These starch molecules, amylose and amylopectin, because of the way the glucose monomers are put together, these are quite soluble in water. Especially when that water is warm. So amylopectin in particular, is quite soluble. 
And it basically has to do with, and I'm just going to laser point, when this thing forms polymers, how many of these hydroxyl groups are still free to interact with the water molecules? The more of these hydroxyl groups there are when this forms its polymer, the more likely that this is to be able to dissolve in water. Cellulose is super, super important. It is another glucose polymer, but because of the way that that polymer is put together and because of the way that, excuse me, because of the way that it branches, cellulose is the tough material um, in plant cell walls. So it's a much tougher material. It's much less resistant to being broken down. Humans and most other mammals actually lack the um, enzymes to break it down. So in humans and in other animals like humans, cellulose is given the name dietary fibre. Is it ER or RE? I don't know. I'm a chemistry teacher, not an English teacher. Get over it. Um, so we humans actually need to eat a certain amount of dietary fibre. Our digestive systems have evolved with that as a consideration. It helps maintain gut health. It helps maintain like regular bowel movements and stuff like that. Um, glycogen. So remember, we've got that prefix glyco which means that it's something to do with sugars. Glycogen is the glucose storage that humans have. And sorry, I'll just say for animals. I know I keep saying humans when I could be using animals, but so glycogen is, remember how when I was talking about lipids, I said that, that they were long-term energy storage. Glycogen is like shorter term. So it's so if you think of fat as being like a safety deposit box at the bank, glycogen is like your everyday FTPOS account. The money isn't in cash. It's not super accessible, but it's pretty easy for you to spend that money. So glycogen is found in the liver in particular and when your blood sugar drops slightly, so let's say it's been a couple of hours since you last ate, your, brain's, your brain and your hormones send out signals to actually partially digest the glycogen that's in our liver to bring our blood sugar back up. So that glycogen is a glucose storage, so it's still a short-term energy storage for animals. Okay, let's carry on here. So uses for glucose, and I think I actually just talked about some of these. Energy for respiration, so there is the standard C6H12O6 plus 6CO2 forms 6CO2 plus 6H2O. Bio people, you should be like saying that chemical formula in your dreams. Chemistry people, you'll be doing that soon enough. Um, uses for glucose, energy storage. This is our glycogen. Um, glucose is also used as precursors. So things like um, earlier I mentioned ribose. So glucose and other sugars can be converted to ribose, which is necessary for the DNA and RNA. There are other examples, but that's the one that's occurring to me right now. And I talked about dietary fiber cellulose. Okay, let's have a look at, I think my next slide is my study guide. Yeah. Okay, so what we've got here, Let's have a look through. We talked about the general formula for carbs. We talked about Hayworth projections. We talked about aldose and ketoses. 
We talked about cyclizing, so forming those ring structures. We talked about glycosidic bonds, and we talked about energy sources and energy reserves. Um, deductions of structural formulae. I will actually find a um, IB question for that one, and I'll give it to you um, in a class. Um, so properties and functions to chemical structures. So I talked about that in the context of um, insoluble dietary fiber versus the um, soluble gly um, glycogen, yes. I told you that those things were in the data booklet. Um, not required, not required, awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. And I shall see you for our next Zoom call, hopefully on Tuesday. I'll send out an invite. Have a fantastic rest of your day and I'll see you next time. Bye.